What have I told you? I'm nervous. <laughs> I'm not comfortable. And John up there from Topaz said to me at the coffee break, Jesus, you're in trouble. He says, all these speakers are great and you're last. <laughs> so the, rea the first thing I would want to say to you is, before you even arrive here, people are making judgments about you. I've got a friend of mine uh, who says the sale starts in the car park. Uh, but the reality is people have made the, make the decision about you almost just as you walk up along here. So think about how do you make an entrance and even if you are nervous, you need to pretend not to be. There's a line that says, uh, fake it until you make it. And I don't agree with that, but what I regularly say to people is, fake it until you are. Until you are the person you want to be. So very simply, this is just, I'm talking to you about tips as a presenter, as a communication. Simply, as you're standing on the wings, as you're standing in the room outside, and I got this, I was doing some coaching with the Abbey actors recently, and they simply, what they do is they simply just do this before they go on, find it in the room, find it outside, whatever it is, just sort of do this, be as big as you can be, then just drop your arms and come in and talk. That's simply zero. There's an American colleague of mine at the Professional Speakers Association, and what he does is he goes in and he boxes toilet cubicles. He goes, rawr, 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 and he's been known to put his fist through a, through a sort of a, a, a partition wall. Now, I'm not suggesting you do that, but certainly you do need to stand your full height, and you do need to be confident, and you do need to fake it until you are. So that's the first suggestion I have for you. The second suggestion I have for you is to do with rehearsal and practice. And the, f the last thing you want to do is be standing up here and hearing your talk out loud for the first time. <laughs> That's the last thing you want to do. So you want to rehearse it. And I was talking to uh, someone earlier today. This is a new talk. This is a talk I haven't done in a while. And I've spent the last two days, full days, preparing for this. Fiona was trying to contact me and I'd switch my inbox off because I didn't want to be disturbed because I wanted to get this talk right. It's not often, if you think about this, I now have an opportunity to talk to 160 senior business people. So two days doesn't seem all that, doesn't seem all that important really. It seems really much more important that I give you the time. So practice. Now the thing that you regularly see and I see pitch coaches saying is practice in front of a mirror. That's the last thing you should do. <laughs> and if you think about it this morning, how many of you came out, and I have a mirror in our hall, many of you come out and you look in the mirror and you say, oh, I look great today. <laughs> I don't think we do that. We say, oh, that tie doesn't go with that shirt. I should have got my hair cut. I should have done this. We see all the things that are wrong. And that's just the way we're educated, unfortunately. We look for the things that are wrong. So don't practice in front of a mirror. Practice with someone who will give you some positive feedback. And I love this where people regularly say to you, oh, I'll give you, a, a, I'll give you some constructive criticism. Constructive criticism is criticism with the word constructive put in front of it. It's still bloody criticism. And we're all delighted to do that. We're all very able to tell people what they're doing wrong. But the real skill is to tell people what they're doing right and get them to do more of it. That's what you really need to do, because we're all good at this um, if, we, if, we go about it, if we go about it in the right way. So that would, they would be in my advice to you. Um, there's a, a lady I was coaching some time ago, Maria, and she was doing a very important pitch. And I said, get someone who will listen to you, get someone who will sort of give you some feedback. We'll be very careful who that person is. Uh, so she came in and she said, I found the right, the right person to do that. And she said, it really worked well. And I said, who was it? And she says, I practiced in the kitchen. The dog sits there. He looks at me and he wags his tail and he thinks I'm great. <laughs> no negative feedback. And it says, she says it works because the point is she's just hearing the talk out loud. And that's my advice to you. Now, the next requirement, of course, oh, where did I do with the clicker? Oh, it's over here. The next requirement is, do you need to know who's your audience? Who's in the audience? So uh, you've got advice from all the other speakers. Well, you need to look up. I got the list the other day. I looked at who was coming. I looked at who I might know, who I wouldn't know, what companies I do business, what companies I wouldn't do business with. Looked, looked at LinkedIn, did all of that sort of stuff. And this is a quote I particularly like. <laughs> I 
And what I see all the time is people deliver, creating presentations for audiences and writing love letters to whom it may concern. They take the last presentation, they change the front slide to the name of whatever the company they're presenting, and they rock up and they do it again. School le lecturers do this all the time. Interestingly, um, what I would say is that you need to get out from behind the lectern, but if you look at this, if you look at this room, this room is set up for what the college calls lectures. So they can stand here, they can read their screen, and they can bore you to death. That's what they can do. But the, the, the problem with this room is this, this, this screen should be out there somewhere, like a newsreader, so I can glance at the screen. So you need to be looking at how does the room work? How is it set up for you? Can you get it set up? That because ideally, that's where, the lecture, that's where the screen should be. So I can glance at that, and I don't have to turn my back on the audience. So look for those sort of things and make those things that they, they help you when you haven't got the room fighting against you. The room will kill you. Doesn't matter how good you are, if the room isn't right, you're dead. You've went to concerts, you've went to shows, and you know because it isn't right, it isn't really as enjoyable. So, so don't be delivering talks that are to whom it may concern. <coughs> now, I need to get to know you. I'm going to ask you something. I'm going to ask you some questions so I get to understand you. So, I want you to pick a shape. Now, can I have a show of hands for the people who pick the square? Okay, just leave your hands up for a moment. What psychologists tell us, oh, this, is, this works a treat. What psychologists <laughs> tell us about the people who pick the square is the left brain people, the organized people, the people who, 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 who think logically, clearly, work things out, deliver clear, concise presentations as Frank has just done. We've got the message, we understand it. If you, being flippant about this, if you were to look in Frank's sock drawer, everything would be neat and tidy. <laughs> all these white shirts are together, all these blue shirts are together, everything, you know, your wardrobe is really neat and tidy. They're the people who pick the square. Can I have a show of hands of people who pick the triangle? Okay. Now, the people who pick the triangle are the right brain people. They're the more creative people. They're the people who don't think in straight lines. You're probably in marketing or branding or PR or something like that. That's the sort of thing you are. You see yourself as being a creative person. Now, can I have, no, even more so, can I ask the people who pick the circle to stand? <laughs> Now, oh, oh, look, oh, this is very good. This is really good. <laughs> They've done this, you are. <laughs> now, I want you to take a good look at the people who've picked the circle. Take a really good look at them, because it's really important to you. Good man, John. <laughs> uh, this is really important to you, because what psychologists tell us about the people who picked the circle is they're into sex, drugs, and rock and roll. <laughs> And I thought you'd like to know. <laughs> okay, so now I know now I know a bit about you. I was, I was talking to Ian at the coffee break. I hadn't put him into the circle group. <laughs> okay, so why are we here? This is why you're here. Take a moment to read this. This is why you're listening to me. If you don't enjoy giving speeches, you better learn how to do it because it's the difference between you being successful in your career and you not being successful in your career. If you're the person who's been called on to do the important pitch, to do the important presentation, when the need to talk to the staff, when you need to get changes in your organization, when you need to have trans for the organization transformed, are you being the person who's called on to do that? And the person who's been called on to do that is the person who's good at communication, who's good at delivery. And I don't say speeches. What I would always say is the person who's good at having a conversation with an audience. I would ban the word lecture. I would ban the word sermons. The reason churches are empty, no one wants to be sermonized to. But I would always th say to you that it needs to be a conversation. You need to be engaging people. You need to talk to people. And that's what will transform your career. 
Now, I'm going to tell you about some of the techniques and the tips for doing that. The first thing you've got to do is you've got to get your audience's attention. Bob Geldof wrote an article in the Times last year, and that's how he opened the article. My father has two pair of underpants. They were a class, they were a class of very baggy Y fronts. Would you want to know what the rest of the story said? Of course you would. Now, the thing that's even more interesting is every radio show on that Saturday and that Sunday talked about that opening line and what he said and gave publicity to the article. So your requirement is get attention straight away. First 20 words, seven seconds. James Bond does it. I went to see Spectre the other night. There's a helicopter fight. There's a guy that's sort of, you, you haven't started on your popcorn, you haven't taken a sip of your Coke, and there's stuff, amazing stuff happening on the screen. It's really, oh, it's James Bond. James Bond does it, Born Identity do it. Say, if you remember Saving Private Ryan, 25 <laughs> minutes of action. No, no one said anything for 25 minutes on that sort of Omaha landing beach, yet you were riveted to it. So that's what, that's what, tel that's what radio does, that's what television does, that's what the movies do. I was coaching some young people recently at a, an event called the Institute for Engineers and Technologists, and one of the guys opened with this slide, and I'm taking, I'm taking, I'm, I'm robbing his idea, or you, as I would say, creative swiping. And what he said was, "I'm going to show you a few slides." <laughs> <laughs> and then I want to give you this one. I'm working with a big, with a company big successful company and the specialist area is, is working with other big multinational companies to help them with their strategies for the organization, to change their strategies and create strategies. And how I got the chief executive to open the talk was to use this, which is a cartoon from the New Yorker in the 1950s, and the cartoon clearly, as you, says, as you see, says, stop and think. And the punchline is that Sort of makes you stop and think, doesn't it? <laughs> that's the punchline. So how we started this pitch was, that's what we do for your organization. We make you stop and think. And over the period of time, that's how we do it. That's, that's the thing we will do for you more than anything else. Cartoon does it in 10 seconds. You could spend two hours droning on about your techniques and your philosophies and everything else. And we, we've done it in, in that sort of short space of time. So get attention. This is the science bit. This is, this is from a book called The Organized Mind, uh, Daniel Levitz, Levins. And he says that in the way we have evolved over a lifetime, what gets our attention is loud noises or bright lights, James Bond, and music. Something moving very quickly gets our attention. A drink. And I was looking at this. <laughs> I was saying, if there was a head on that, you wouldn't, you have, a, wouldn't you have a drink of it? <laughs> so, and you think the best, best chat up line ever. Can I buy you a drink? So it works. And then attractively shaped potential sexual partners. I ain't going there this hour of the morning. <laughs> I've learned my lesson. I ain't going there. But that's what gets our attention. So let me tell you how I've converted that into how you get attention in terms of opening a talk. You ask a question. How many of our speakers started off by asking the audience a question? Who here does whatever? The... So simply what you're doing is you think about it. You didn't turn up here saying, oh, this is Andrew Kyo from Aristo, and this is going to be great. You turned up saying, there was three emails I needed to send. I should have talked to so-and-so. I should have taken that call. I should have called someone back. So my job, and the other speaker's jobs, is to switch you off from whatever you were thinking about to think about us. Folk, put your attention here. So ask a question, does that? Pay a compliment. How many companies go to huge efforts to be on the best employer list of companies who give money to social entrepreneurs, who do all of... You needn't write these things down. I see several of you writing them down. You're very happy to have the slides. When I was doing engineering in Bolton Street way back when, uh, we had a retired railway engineer was our, was our lecturer. And what he said when we joined, when we entered the room the first time, he said to us, when I'm speaking to you, I never want to see the top of your head. When I'm speaking to you, I want you to look at me. I'll give you the notes, or I'll give you time to take notes at the end, but when I'm speaking to you, I want you to look at me. And he had a way of guaranteeing that. 
he threw chalk at you. <laughs> <laughs> if you look down, you've got a lump of chalk on the side of your head. Now, they can't do that anymore. But, <laughs> but you're very welcome to have all of this. And I'll be saying to you at the end, we do a little um, communication tips booklet, which you've signed up from the website. It's free, and we can send you either a hard or a soft copy. And everything I say is in there. Related dramatic or humorous instance, deliver a startling paper of power of conviction, create mystery or intrigue. They're the, things that you, they're the things that you can do. Mystery, intrigue, pick a shape. How do I get your attention? That's what I, what, that's what I do. In the body of the talk, there are three requirements. And you can ask yourselves, and I was asking myself as I was listening to the other speakers, how many of these speakers, and they all did, how many of these speakers qualified under these three headlines? Have they earned the right to talk about what they were talking about? And if you think, think of Dermot, I suspect Dermot could have spoke to us for the whole day based on his experience and his knowledge and all the stuff he's done. So he's clearly earned the right to do it. Uh, is he excited about his subject? Yes, he most definitely is. And is he eager to share it with? Yes, so he ticks all three boxes and so do the other, so do the other speakers. So they're the three requirements that you need to do what we're often doing, spending too much time on, is about creating slides and creating images and doing all of that sort of stuff and pulling up slides and spend an hour look, as I did yesterday, I spent half an hour looking for that slide of the children's slides. It's not about the slides, it's never about the slides, it's always about you and the connection you have with the audience. I would say to you in most cases, don't turn, have no slides, and, and, uh, and Frank talk, did that and used very few slides, and Eleanor the same, very few slides, and that's how it should be. So, earn the right, excited subject, eager to share. Let me give you an example of that. Um, what I'm always looking when I'm working with senior executives, I'm working with a company at the moment, a company called Scurry, um, uh, Rory O'Connor. And they're now about four or five years in business, a startup company. They're now going very well. And he's now getting asked to speak at conferences and events. And it can't be a sales pitch, but he wants to be able to tell his story. Interestingly, Irish company from Waterford, they've developed a piece of software. And it's now being used, and I may get this figure not quite right, but it's the gist of it. They're now being used by 16 of the, the world's top 20 online selling companies. They're using Scurry software from, from Wexford. And when you talk about excited Aaron to write, and I talked to him about stories he wants to tell, the reason he started the business is he, he worked in a very high pressure company, multinational company in Ireland, and the guy who looked after shipping and transport died of a heart attack on the job because of dealing with the pressure of sending things to the wrong place and not getting it and missing deadlines. Literally died of a heart attack on the job. And Rory said, there's got to be a better way to do this. got to be a simpler way to do this. And, that's what, and he tells that story. And the other story he tells, which I love, is about sort of getting things right. And the story he tells is about um, the lady in the Midlands, and I better not say which town, lady in the Midlands who got a parcel from one of the courier companies, and they said, do parcel, and she sort of signed for it, and then she, sort of, and then she was sort of thinking, did I, did I order anything online? And she wasn't quite sure what she did. And then, and then she, sort of, she was opening it, and inside was some lingerie. But the lingerie was of a sort of a, large, a rather large size. And she sort of said, oh, oh, Jesus. And then she looked, at the, she looked at the address, and then she realized it wasn't her. But there was a, a similar lady at the other end of the road, and the, it had just been delivered to the wrong address. So then she had to sort of close it back up, walk down the street, knock on the door. This lady opened, she said, I think this is for you. <laughs> <laughs> So that's not the sort of thing you'd want to happen, and that's the sort of thing he says we don't want to happen. So we want to make sure that everyone gets what they want on time. And, but the, how, you, how he gets his message across is by telling humorous and engaging and important stories. Stories always work. If you take, if you take Elaine's situation, she wants you to sort of put a brake on things, so she tells you about sort of driving the car with the handbrake on it, so she makes herself look a bit sort of silly. But what happens is you remember the story. Yeah, we've all driven with the handbrake on. We've all done that. And then the message is, so what brakes are you putting on yourself? The story reminds you of the message. That's the real skill. If you listen to Joe Duffy, 
it's a, and we were talking about, Ian and I were talking about this at break. No, uh, and I recommend strongly that you don't listen to Joe Duffy <laughs> <laughs> if you want to remain sane. But the point is that why Joe Duffy works is people tell stories. They peop and they put all the detail and all the personal stuff and all the issues in it. And you're there. You know people. That could be my mother. That could be my brother. That could be my sister. You buy into that. And what happens, the people who respond, people, business people and par, uh, the HSE and the politicians, they respond not with stories, but they respond with statistics. It's 15% down on uh, waiting on trolleys last, than this year than last year. And then the guys, yeah, but my mother's been on it for four days. Now suddenly the 15% down is lost. So don't respond with st statistics and facts and benefits. Respond with stories. The thing that I coach scientists all the time here in Ireland, research, mainly researchers, and the stuff that they're doing in terms of cancer research and the improvements in healthcare has been unbelievable. But we, all we ever hear about is what's wrong. I talked about this at coffee break. It wasn't intended to be in the talk, but I talked about it at coffee break. Was, um, the other day, or just before Christmas, there was a lady on from Carrigan Shannon, and she owned the cinema, or her family owned the cinema in Carrigan Shannon. And she was talking about they'd got the floodwaters down, the floodwaters had sunk a little bit, she'd got them down, and uh, the cinema was open and the town was open for business. And O'Rourke sort of said to her at the end of the interview, after listening to her, I'm trying to think of his first name, that won't come to me. Sean, Sean O'Rourke said to her at the end of the interview, so I suppose people will still be coming to the cinema in their wellies. Now, that's not the message she wanted to deliver, but that's the message RTE put out. They're still going to their cinema in their wellies in Carrigan Shannon because that's sort of the sort of stuff that they do. Um, so, <laughs> earn the right, be excited, be eager to share. They're the requirements. What we regularly do with people is we coach them to how to create good openings, we coach them how to create closes, and simply the close of every talk must say, at the end of every talk, it must say, let me tell you how you're better. That's what it has to say. I'm going to tell you how you're better. Let me, let me remind you how you're going to be better and finish up by saying, let me tell you how you're better. So what we do then in the middle bit is we give you templates for the appropriate talks. And in reality, there's only three types of talk. There's a talk that, to inform the mind. There's a talk to touch the heart. And there's a talk to change the will. So which one of those talks are you doing? And then I would suggest this, whichever one of those you're doing, it needs to also be entertaining. Not funny ha-ha, but it needs to be entertaining. So which one of those are you doing? And we give you an appropriate template. So rather than starting with blank pages, you're starting with a template, and we find the stories, and we create the stories. But they're always your stories. They're never my stories. They're always your stories. So go back to this organized mind. Attention is a limited capacity resource. One task at a time, our brain functions best if we stick to one task. That's what they're now discovering. So this thing about multitasking and all that sort of stuff, it's all nonsense. If you want to do something really well, you focus on one thing. And the reason I've put that up there is that when I'm coaching people to present, I'm saying, what's the one key message you want to deliver? And the number of times the people I'm working with say, I have no bloody idea. <laughs> so then we have to work out what it is, the one key message. But you can't deliver me 10. There's a lawyer that says, if you try to make 10 points to a jury, you make none. So what's the one key point that's going to sway that jury? And in the same way, what's the one key point in terms of your talk that's going to get the message across? You can have facts and evidence and statistics and things to support it. But if you try and make five or six points, you make none. What's the key message? And if you think about the speakers who went before, what was the one key message they would want to deliver to you? And what will you take, what will you take away from it? When we come to the close, and again, I love this quote. <laughs> I have no idea who Lord Moncroft is, but I love the quote. A speech is like a love affair. <laughs> Any fool can start it, but to end it requires considerable skill. <laughs> And what happens with most talks I see and most speeches I see is put, people put a whole lot of effort at the beginning and a whole lot of effort into the middle. And then by the time you get that and you've pulled all the slides and it's sort of 12 o'clock at night or 1 o'clock in the morning and you're just knackered and you say, oh, feck it, and you just sort of let it go. 
how you start is, if you go back to Stephen Covey's, uh, one of his principles of highly effective habits, seven habits of highly effective people, is you start with the end in mind. When you're preparing the talk, you start with, how do I want to finish this talk? What's the key message I want to deliver to this person? How am I going to tell this person, this company, this organization, they're better as a result of what I'm suggesting? And what is that better? And how do we paint that picture? They're the ways you can do it. Uh, dramatize your ideas, repeat the benefit, use an appropriate quotation. Uh, that's what I've just done here. Appeal to a person's nobler motives. And again, Elaine was talking about this quite a bit. Nobler motives are what charities appeal to all the time. You've heard the ad for years that works, and every time it comes on, I listen to it. It says, send us two euro or send us 10 euro. With the 10 euro, we can buy a goat or we can buy a cow, and we can ship it to a village in Africa. It can provide milk for the village. It can provide meat for the village. But when the goat or the cow has a calf, we give it to the next village. Not only do you feed one village, but you feed two villages. And you can do all of that for 10 euro. That's appealing to nobler motives. That's what gets you orders, that's what gets you business. Appeal to nobler motives. What are, what are the nobler motives that you appeal to? And you, the point is, and this is the point Dermot made, is unless you have, and this is the whole conversation all three speakers were, unless you're listening, unless you're engaging, you don't know what the nobler motives are. Uh, the simplest of a fr friend of mine, Brian Sullivan, and he has a line that says, what most of us do is listen to respond what you need to do is listen to understand. That's the real key issue. When you understand, then you will know what the nobler motives are, and you can pitch to those no nobler motives. So very simply, the basics are get attention in the first 20 words of seven seconds, show that you've earned the right, that you're excited, that you're eager in the body of the talk, and finish by telling the audience how they'll be better as a result of what you're saying and doing to them. Uh, the, uh, uh, John was talking, when we were talking at the coffee break this morning, we were talking about, um, if you don't listen to it, listen to it. I'm, I'm, I read occasionally business books, but most of them are deadly boring. And the organized mind is one of the examples. It's a real struggle. You have to go and find somewhere quiet that you're not going to be interrupted to, to work through this. So I'm much more listening to creative books and creative writers. Uh, and the thing I would strongly suggest to you is download the podcast for Desert Island Discs and just listen to that. It's the most amazing people. But a couple of weeks ago, there was a lady on called Sandy Toxvik. And she's a comedian and writer. And she gave me this analogy. And she said her father, when he was telling her how to be a writer, he said, writing, and I would say exactly the same for, for creating speeches, writing is like fishing. He says, the first thing you've got to do is decide what type of fish you want to catch. And that's your audience. And then you've got to choose what's the bait that will catch that fish. So is it a, is it a worm? Is it a fly? Is it a spinnaker? So what's the bait that will catch that particular fish? So what's the bait that you will use? What stories will you use? What analogies will you use? What statistics will you use to attract that particular person? When you've caught the fish, then what you've got to do is you've got to fillet the fish and only serve up the very best bits. And that's the same in the talk. It's when you've, you've put it all together and you have the 50 slides, then you say, how do I make this five slides? How do I get rid of all of that sort of stuff? And how do I make it five slides? And how do I make it really interesting? So that's the analogy I would use. If you take that analogy home each time you come to prepare, think about fishing, take that home. Um, I'm now winding back to how this company pitched and won the contract, and I'm now winding back to the same. Have I stopped and made you think? And if I have, I've been successful. If you stop and think and do nothing, I haven't been successful. If you stop and think and change one or two things about how you go and present and pitch, I've been successful. And let me tell you how this is really important, just to remind you back to this. Do schools kill creativity? is a talk by Sir Ken Robinson. It's on TED Talks. At this, the last time I looked, it's a, it's a talk I look at probably every couple of months. The last time I looked, he had 36 million views of this particular talk. And Frank's talk reminded me of it a lot of the, he speaks for 19 minutes, and for 15 of the 19 minutes, you're laughing. He's telling you funny stories, 
He's telling you things that are really interesting and they're really fun. But at the end of each one, there's a message. And as a result of these talks, I remember, I remember the messages. And if you take Frank's example of, uh, we've all heard it and we've heard Roy Keane talk about it and all the rest of it. If you keep doing the same thing, you'll get the same result and all of that, all of that sort of stuff. That, am I quoting you right there? Now? Am I? Yeah, if you always do what you've always done, you always, do, you always get the same always thing. And then what he does is he tells this fantastic story about the dog going to the door. <laughs> <laughs> Now what will happen is you'll remember the story about the dog going to the door and then you'll say, well, am I doing that? Am I the person who keeps going to the door when there's, I'm doing the same thing? So look up at Ken Robinson, but the point is that we all, want, and particularly in this busy life, we want to be entertained, we want to be engaged, and we want to learn stuff. And he does that. He does that in a really interesting way. One of the, how he opens the talk is he says, this is, it's, the talk is now about 2008, and he says, in 2000, in, 2050, people who are now starting school will retire. He said, what are we educating them for? Do we have any idea what we're educating them for or what we need to educate them for for 2050? No, we don't. He says, do we have any, any idea what we need to educate them for in five years' time? No, we don't. That's the scary <laughs> thing about it. So he talks about, he talks about that. But have a look at it, and it's, it's how I would suggest it's stories that work. There's just a whole load of stories, but it's important messages. Take a moment to read that. Gossip talks about others. Bohr talks about himself. A salesman talks about his product, and many of us do that. And a brilliant conversationalist talks about you. I hope I've talked about you this morning. Um, if I have, you can follow me, you can link with me, or if you want to, there's a free communication tips booklet, which I've talked to you about. Sign up, we'll send it to you for free. Thank you very much.